Yes, I can hear you. Uh, just are you able to see my slides? Yes, we can see them. Thank you. So you can put them on slideshow. Uh, thank you, and welcome to today's CME on Wilms Tumor. And we are going to be doing an overview of uh, Wilms Tumor. As you all know, September is the uh, Childhood Cancer Awareness Month, and uh, as much as possible, uh, we would like to have a better understanding of uh, the childhood cancers that we encounter in Kenya and how. Uh, to recognize them and diagnose them. So uh, first off, before we get into Wilms tumor, uh, I'd like to bring your attention to this uh, website. Uh, this is the Ministry of Health Virtual Academy website, where you are able, as a healthcare worker, you'll be able to uh, learn more about childhood cancers. Uh, basically, the site is elearning.health.go.ke and uh, from there you go you you're required to uh, register and have an account and then you can go ahead and do the courses there are quite a variety of of courses uh, among them is the non-communicable disease courses from there you click on cancer courses early diagnosis and Module seven will give you childhood cancers. So there are a total of nine sessions in this um, in this module, uh, and renal tumors is uh, one of the sessions. And you're able to get your CPD points that you can claim with whichever platform you're uh, you're on. So we'll go to Wilms tumor, which is named uh, after Max Wills, who was a general surgeon. Uh, a more common name would be nephroblastoma. So on the epidemiology, this is the most common form of uh, kidney cancer in children. And uh, it's a tumor of embryonic tissue that has not yet fully developed. And it's found between, uh, it's six, it, it accounts for six to 7% of all childhood cancers with a slight female predominance. But in some literature, uh, it reports that it male-female ratio is almost the same. But it's more common in black children with a high, higher, just a slightly higher incidence in black children. And uh, 75 to 80 percent of children with nephroblastoma or Wilms tumor will be diagnosed uh, before the fifth year of, uh, of life. And the peak incidence is between three and four years. So majority of the nephroblastoma or Wilms tumor is usually sporadic in nature. And only 1% of the cases uh, will there be any uh, familial um, uh, incidents. And part of, the, of this is that even when you have a familial Wilms tumor, it's not likely to be a direct parent, but you can have a history in the, in the family of Wilms tumor in 1%. Uh, 12 to 15 percent of the cases are associated with genetic abnormalities, and we'll look at the exact uh, at them shortly. And of which of all the Wilms tumor that we get, about five percent of the cases you'll have bilateral Wilms tumor, which means you have uh, cancer in both kidneys. So the associated uh, syndromes usually there is uh, WAGR. Uh, in which case you'll have Wilms tumor, aniridia, genitourinary anomalies, and mental retardation. Others include Dennis Drush syndrome, uh, beckwith Winderman syndrome, which is uh, uh, an overgrowth syndrome, and other syndromes that are associated with, with Wilms tumor. Uh, Wilms tumor will, uh, in terms of etiology, uh, the exact cause is unknown, though there is an association with uh, changes in uh, uh, nephrogenic rest. So uh, this primitive kidney tissue uh, undergoes some changes. It does not properly regress. And you have some um, either uh, deletions or alterations in the genes uh, for, this, uh, for this tissue. And then they develop into, into a tumor. You have increased 
um, the, uh, increased multiplication of the of the cells, and the body is not able to uh, have them undergo programmed cell, cell death as usually happens when you have abnormal tissue, and they grow into into a tumor. So when it comes to the clinical presentation. A majority of our children will present with an abdominal mass or abdominal swelling. Most likely, this will be a child between the ages of three and five years. Uh, they will have uh, a mass that is palpated either by a relative or during a clinic visit. Um, it is usually non-tender in the beginning. There are no other symptoms. Or the child looks healthy. Majority of the time when you ask the parents, they'll tell you they thought the child was, well, was eating well. That's, when the, that's why the stomach was, was quite big. So the problem with our centers is that these masses usually uh, increase in size without any diagnosis. And we happen to get uh, patients with uh, large masses, lab, uh, an enlarged abdomen with symptoms. And in that case, the symptoms that are associated with Wilms tumor would be abdominal pain. Sometimes you can get hematuria, that is blood in urine. Uh, at times you can get hypertension, vomiting, fever. So, yeah. So with two thirds of the patients, the textbook, the textbook definition of Wilms tumor in our setup will be only in about a third of the patients. But in two thirds of the patients, they will come with large tumors crossing the midline. One of the things that you read about is that uh, if you look at the difference between a nephroblastoma and a neuroblastoma is that a nephroblastoma does not cross the midline, but in our setup, you tend to get patients with uh, nephroblastomas that cross, uh, cross the, uh, the midline. Uh, that enlarged tumor has a very high chance of rupture. You'll have higher chances of having pretreatment necrosis with increased risk of infection and other and other comorbidities in these children, malnutrition, fever, may occur. So how do you investigate? The most common, most widely available uh, modality you can get is an abdominal ultrasound. And this is the first thing that you're likely to do. And when you do your abdominal ultrasound, you get an enlarged kidney or a mass in the kidney. And in that case, if you ever suspect Wilms tumor, refer the child to a comprehensive center where uh, children with cancer can be treated. Because the sooner you do your treatment, the better for the patients, the less likely your complications, uh, complications in terms of enlarged tumors cause more morbidity, even when you're trying to do uh, surgeries. So anytime you suspect Williams tumor, refer the patient for treatment. The centers that are there that treat Williams tumor, that's MTRH, KNH, Kijabe, uh, Gertrude's, or speak to one of yours. Let speak to the pediatrician, let them uh, tell you how to go ahead and, and refer. So once you do your ultrasound and you find there's an enlarged mass, the next thing you're likely to do is do a CT scan of the abdomen. And uh, in the CT scan of the abdomen, uh, you'll find a well-defined mass with very nice borders. And if you look at this image, um, on, the, on the left of your screen, you can see the contralateral a uh, kidney which has taken up contrast really well. But on this other side where you have that huge mass, you can't see the sh that typical shape of the kidney is not there. But at the top of it, you can see a nice rim of normal tissue that forms what we call the clothine in Wilms tumor. That is the part of the normal tissue makes a claw uh, around your, your tumor. So in definition, you, you're likely to get a mass that is either homogeneous in nature or has cystic components. Uh, they'll describe whether or not it is, there is the involvement of the renal sinus or the IVC. 
in the same image of the abdomen, uh, you look at your liver and see whether there are any uh, metastases. So um, the other investigations you like uh, you should do is uh, usually uh, Wilms tumor metastases uh, metastases to uh, the lungs. That's the most common area of metastases and the liver. So you need to do imaging of the chest. Uh, what is readily available and just as good is a chest X-ray where you're looking for cannonballs. A CT scan would be a better uh, imaging if it is available, but uh, an X-ray will, will do just as well. Uh, other areas of metastasis are less common, but you can get uh, metastasis in the brain and in bone. So other than this, you're going to do your CBC and you can get anemia. Sometimes you get bleeding uh, of that tumor, intra, uh, intra tumor bleeds that can be quite uh, fatal sometimes if there is no uh, intervention that is done. Urinalysis, you're looking for any signs of hematuria, LFTs. Uh, most of the time you will not have any changes even with uh, metastasis to the liver, but it is something you should look out for. And when you're doing your LFTs, you also do alkaline phosphatase uh, to see whether or not you really need to go looking for bone meds. Um, UECs, as you prepare for um, as you prepare for, for uh, chemotherapy, you need to get your baselines. Uh, you, most of the time, you're not uh, likely to have uh, any derangements, but if you do, uh, check also if you're having, if the other kidney is, is working well or uh, there's something wrong with uh, the other kidney. Uh, that you can uh, glean from your, from your imaging and other studies. An echo is quite essential. And uh, the reason why we do the echocardiogram, it's because some of the treatments that we use uh, affects the heart. It causes uh, cardiomyopathy. So you need the echo for baseline um, uh, evaluation. And as I've said, uh, a chest X-ray is also required. So, um, when you do all this imaging, once you think of this child should be in a treatment center by the time you're doing all this. Uh, some people will ask, do we do the, uh, the CT scan in the periphery or do you uh, get the child after the ultrasound refer immediately? The answer to that, it depends on where you are. Most of the time you would need, after the ultrasound, you'd need to refer the patients because uh, the CT scan you do pre-chemotherapy and post-chemotherapy uh, needs to be compared side by side to, to determine whether there is any effect. So you do not necessarily need to do your CT scan in the periphery. You can send the patient uh, to the treatment center just with uh, uh, a suspected Wilms tumor on, uh, on ultrasound. So the treatment that we give is usually the chemotherapy followed by surgery and then uh, depending on the staging, you can do radiotherapy or no radiotherapy. And the first treatment, we do about six weeks of treatment with vincristine, actinomycin D, and doxorubicin, after which we go for surgery to determine uh, one of where you do the surgery and also do staging. And for Wilms tumor specifically, you do not need to do biopsy. You can treat a uh, Wilms tumor just using the, uh, the CT scan confirmation or, or suspicion of Wilms tumor. And then from there, you will be able to get your tissue during surgery. And like all the other solid tumors where you require to do biopsy upfront. And the reason for this is that the minute you do a biopsy for Wilms tumor, you upstage that tumor to a stage three. So preferably treatment, surgery, and then you get biopsy during surgery. Uh, the staging, usually we use the style of staging, whereby for stage one, the tumor is limited to the kidney, 
and the tumor is extracted uh, wholesome without uh, any rupture to, to the capsule. Then for stage two, there is, um, the tumor has uh, is outside the capsule, but you're able to get it. If you're able to get all of it uh, during surgery, then that will be stage two. And in this case, the, there are no lymph node uh, involvement. For stage three, this is a tumor that has either local spread or you had rupture of the capsule and spillage of uh, tumor spillage into the abdominal cavity. Yeah. And then for stage four, you have distance metastasis, that is to the lungs, to the liver, bone, or brain. And for stage five, it is bilateral nephroblastoma. And we've had several uh, cases of uh, bilateral nephroblastoma, and they can be treated. So when it comes to our differential diagnosis, uh, one of the most common uh, things to look at is other um, other causes of abdominal swelling and abdominal masses. And if you look at if you look at your, uh, your the abdomen, if it is on the on the right side, you're looking at uh, is this the kidney or is this a liver? So if it's a liver, you can get. Um, uh, masses of the liver, hepatoblastoma would be one of them. Other things, uh, on the other side, you can get uh, a spleen. On the left side, you can get a spleen. Is it a kidney or is this the spleen? Uh, the direction of growth or direction of enlargement of a spleen is quite different from uh, that of um, uh, a, a kidney. Um, you look at, uh, is this a tumor of the kidney? Uh, is it a neuroblastoma? A neuroblastoma would be a tumor on the suprarenal area that is um, the adrenal, the adrenal gland. So even on your imaging, you'll get a compression, compression of that normal kidney downwards. So you get normal kidney tissue without that um, closing being seen. The other things you look at in neuroblastoma is uh, one, uh, we've said uh, usually a neuroblastoma will early on cross in uh, uh, the midline, but with large Wilms tumor, it's also likely to cross the midline. Uh, you're more likely to get calcifications for neuroblastoma, but on 10%, around 10% of nephroblastomas can also have calcifications. That's something to, to keep in mind. It is not an absolute. Um, other things, oh yes, um, neuroblastomas are more likely to be um, to be having metastases at uh, at diagnosis, and they tend to occur in a, uh, in younger ages than uh, than a nephron. Um, the other things, uh, renal medullary carcinoma, rhabdoid tumor of the kidney. Uh, mesoblastic nephromas, all these are malignancies uh, found in almost the, in the same areas. So mesoblastic nephroma, uh, this is the most common renal tumor in the first months of life. And it's important to make this differentiation because uh, the treatment of the mesoblastic nephroma will be slightly different from uh, Wilms tumor, and they are, uh, we are able to uh, treat this use, using surgery uh, on its own. And then, yeah. So, treatment, as we said, there's pre op chemotherapy, surgery, post op, chemo, uh, post -op chemotherapy, plus and minus uh, radiotherapy. So the general principles of uh, surgery, usually we do a radical nephrectomy and it's uh, you remove the entire uh, kidney on that side together with the ureter. Uh, we do lymph node sampling and it's quite important to uh, ensure we get lymph node uh, sampling. As you've seen, it's part of um, it's part of staging and will give you more information on whether or not uh, you require radiotherapy for this particular patient. Ideally, you should get at least seven node samples, uh, depends on, on your surgeon. So the ureter is ligated, and um, before, before the bettering of advancement in um, 
in imaging techniques. There used to be necessity to inspect the contralateral kidney, but with good uh, imaging, right now we don't need to explore the contralateral uh, kidney during surgery. Then there is uh, what we call nephron sparing surgery. This one is usually done for bilateral uh, Williams tumor where uh, you're trying to save or to get as much tissue um, spared as possible uh, because if these two uh, kidneys have tumor and you remove both of them and you leave nothing there, then uh, the issue of uh, kidney uh, uh, renal insufficiency has to be dealt with. And as much as possible, we try and do uh, nephron sparing surgery, and this is feasible even in Kenya. So how do we decide once we've done the pre-op chemotherapy, which is the same for all stages, how do we decide what to do post-op. So post-op chemotherapy will largely depend on your histology and the, the, um, the histology and staging. So for histology, uh, there is what we call favorable Wilms tumor and unfavorable Wilms tumor. So majority of the patients will have up to 80%, 85% uh, of patients will have favorable histology. And this means that you have a triphasic pattern on your histology with blastemol, epithelial, and stromal tissue. The most malignant of the three tissues is the blastemol component. Yeah. And, uh, but currently with advancement in science, other things that can be done on that tissue will be looking at um, whether or not uh, the uh, cytogenetics of it. So you can have a poor prog uh, prognosis uh, on uh, favorable histology if you have loss of heterozygosity in uh, chromosome 1P or 16Q, but that's uh, something we are currently uh, not able to, to do routinely. And unfavorable histology uh, would give you a poorer prognosis and uh, poor uh, survival and will require you to, uh, to, do, to look at your chemotherapy, what kind of chemotherapy are you going to give. Um, favorable histology includes your uh, anaplasia. So whether you have focal anaplasia or diffuse anaplasia, that's uh, not uh, very favorable. And you also look at uh, whether the amount of shrinkage of the tumor during the pre-op treatment. So if you look at your, uh, your tissue post uh, the pre-op treatment and you have up to 100% necrosis, then you don't require a very extensive uh, chemotherapy after surgery and you use the low risk uh, protocol with only vincristin and doctomycin. And for regression, 66 to 99% uh, regression, you're going to use your intermediate risk. Uh, for high risk, this is patients with um, majority blastemol component, uh, patients with uh, diffuse anaplasia are high risk. Yeah. You will use the high risk comp uh, high risk protocol, which has been Christine, actinomycin D, and doxorubicin for uh, for treatment. Um, I think we've explained all this. So the other thing that is quite important is radiotherapy. And for radiotherapy, if you look at um, sorry, I I think uh, the slide with the uh, uh, the difference in radiotherapy what it means has, has been deleted, sorry. Um, so for radiotherapy, if you have stage three, um, stage three disease, you require to do abdominal radiotherapy. Uh, if you have chest metastasis, you require to do uh, chest radiotherapy. And if you have stage two, but you have uh, anaplasia in histology, these are patients that also require abdominal uh, radiotherapy. So stage five, specifically for stage five, if you have both kidneys affected by tumor, uh, additionally, you're going to stage each of the 
uh, of these tumors of each kidney separately. And usually you will do uh, chemotherapy, then try and do nephron sparing surgery uh, and uh, plus minus uh, radiotherapy. So what's the prognosis for Wilms tumor? It's actually very good compared to other types of uh, cancers. And for favorable histology, you can get 99 to 86% uh, uh, overall survival five year. And for unfavorable histology, it will range between 84 to 38%. Uh, Majority of a Wilms, uh, Wilms tumor patients, if they have a proper treatment, and proper treatment means they have completed the entire treatment protocol, pre-op treatment, surgery, post-op treatment, those who require uh, radiotherapy have their radiotherapy. Uh, even in Kenya, you have uh, survival going uh, above 75%, almost 80%. So uh, other things that determine prognosis is uh, evidence of anaplasia in histology. So with diffuse anaplasia giving you a worse uh, prognosis. Um, age more than two years, uh, large size uh, tumors, um and yes if you have small tumors but you have a resistance to chemotherapy usually those ones with anaplasia uh will have uh less or poorer uh, uh, uh response to chemotherapy that can give you a poor prognosis even with a with a small tumor so in conclusion one, Wilms tumor is the most common primary renal tumor of childhood. Most cases are sporadic. You're not likely to get a family history of Wilms tumor. Uh, the most common presentation would be an abdominal swelling or an abdominal mass. If you see an abdominal mass, the simplest investigation you can do, which is available to almost everyone in this country, is an ultrasound of the abdomen. And with that ultrasound of the abdomen, you're able to refer this patient, you're able to talk to your uh, oncologist on how to refer the patient and get them care. Uh, to get care to them. So it's very important if you suspect Wilms tumor, refer the patient. Do not uh, let them stay in the periphery for extended periods of time. So children with suspected uh, Wilms tumor should always be referred to a pediatric oncology unit. Uh, majority of those patients are taken care of in MTRH and KNH and a few other places. Uh, the, the treatment uh, is multimodal. It has surgery, uh, it has um, radiotherapy and chemotherapy. And surgery is a cornerstone of treatment. You cannot have uh, chemotherapy alone. You cannot have radiotherapy alone. Surgery would be a must. And it's something that you really need to explain to patients. Uh, Post-surgical therapy is stage and histology dependent and includes both chemo and radio and prognosis for Wilms tumor is really good. And uh, for that, kindly uh, look at the MOH uh, virtual academy platform to get more information on Wilms tumor. Uh, refer your colleagues to that uh, platform to learn more about Wilms tumor and all other uh, pediatric malignancies. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Alice Bishemi. We really appreciate the materials we've gotten. So we are going to move to the next presenter, who is Dr. Esther Nafula. But before that, remember that you can also get the same materials on the M. Saratani app, which can be downloaded through the Google or even the iPhone. The iPhone uh, downloading. So you're able to get the M Saratani or use the MOH virtual academy for the for the materials on Williams tumor. So next you're going to welcome Dr. Esther Nafula, who is a pediatric medicine physician and the head of unit in pain and palliative care in the Kenyatta National Hospital. Uh, Dr. Nafula is going to take us through pediatric uh, pediatric palliative care. In case you have any question from the previous session,
kindly write it on the Q&A session. Thank you. Welcome, Dr. Nafula. Thank you, Stacey. So um, we are now going into the second uh, presentation and we are going to talk about uh, pediatric palliative care. I will just put that on slideshow. You are able to hear me? Yes, we can get you clearly, thank you. All right, so we are going to talk about uh, pediatric palliative care. And uh, the objective of this presentation is uh, by the end, I expect that you will be able to define what uh, palliative care for children is and at least have an overview of the scope of children's palliative care. So I have three questions that I would like you to think about and maybe we can type our responses in the chat by the end of the presentation. What comes to mind when you hear the word palliative care? Do you think children need palliative care and when should they be referred to palliative care? So feel free as we go along with the discussion, you can type uh, your responses and even at the end, we'll still reflect on these three questions. So I'm going to use two cases this afternoon for my discussion. The first case is a 10 year old patient with three month history of left knee pain associated with a mass. He is diagnosed with osteogenic sarcoma. This patient presents with severe pain associated with limited mobility. It has been recommended that he gets an above knee amputation and chemotherapy. And at the same time, he's been referred to palliative care for pain management. He has two younger siblings and comes from a single parent family. The father died of a road traffic accident. So this is one of the very typical cases that we manage in the palliative care unit. Uh, children are referred to us because of pain management. But a few things I would like you to note from this case is that this child needs to undergo an amputation. That is a life altering procedure. The child needs to undergo chemotherapy and the child is also in pain. So the management is long-term. Case number two is baby Cindy who suffered hypoxic brain injury at birth and was admitted to NICU for three months. At the time of discharge, the baby still has convulsions and apnea, but is discharged on home care with a tracheostomy, feeding via peg tube, and is to continue with palliative care at home. This is the first born to her parents, so she's an only child. And the expected uh, prognosis is actually poor because of the hypoxia. So again, we are looking at a child who we are expecting to have a lot of suffering and needs a lot of care and a lot of contact with the medical personnel. So who is a child? In Kenya, a child is anyone who is less than 18 years old. So there are different stages of development from birth to 28 days, they are neonates, then they are infants up to one year, they become adolescents after 13 years, but Basically, anyone less than 18 years in Kenya is considered to be a child. So pediatric palliative care, therefore, has been defined by the World Health Organization as the total care of the child's body, mind, and spirit, and also involves taking care of the child's family. If we look at, at that, uh, this is a very simple definition from the World Health Organization that we actively take care of a child, their body, their mind, and their spirit. But if we make it a bit technical, pediatric palliative care is interdisciplinary care that aims to relieve suffering and improves the quality of life for children who are suffering life-threatening or life-limiting conditions together with their families. So we don't only take care of the children, we take care of the families as well. If you reflect upon the two cases we've talked about, we have a single parent with three children and now the firstborn has been diagnosed with uh, osteosarcoma. So there's going to be a lot of adjustment in this family. So it's not just about managing the child's pain, but we also have to take care of the family. The other family that is having a child with hypoxic brain injury and it's their first child, the child may eventually die from their illness. So there's a lot of psychological suffering that is also associated with the diagnosis. 
So when we're taking care of children, we have to consider what are their physical symptoms. That means what brings them to hospital, what is their medical diagnosis, what kind of interventions do they need? We have to look at psychological issues. How is the illness affecting the child? What does the child understand to be the cause of their illness? Uh, what are the wishes of the child? We have a 10 year old who needs an amputation. Do we take time to counsel the child and explain to them what an amputation means, how their life is going to change post an amputation and what kind of support we are able to give them? Do we talk to the child to find out how this illness is affecting their day-to-day -day living? Then when it comes to spiritual issues, children also have spiritual issues because they are taught. They are taught, they observe, they learn from the environment and they give a sense of meaning to their lives. So depending on which culture, religion, spirituality of the family that the child has been brought up in, the child develops an understanding of life, death, afterlife, an understanding of decision-making. So it is good to also explore these issues because when we are giving palliative care, we have to take care of the whole child. It's not just about managing the medical diagnosis that has brought them to hospital. Then we look at social aspects as well. Children love to play, they go to school, they're concerned about their body image, depending on which stage of development they are in. Uh, illness of a child does not just affect a child. When a child is sick, the whole family is sick, the extended family is sick, the community. So we have to look at all those aspects. Well, how is the family taking the illness? How are the siblings? Have they even been informed that their sibling is sick? Or they just see, their brother going to hospital uh, for months on end and no one is taking time to explain to them what their brother is suffering from. What support are we giving to these siblings? What about the friends to this child in church, in school, in the neighborhood? Then what, when it comes to child life, what are the things that the child is interested in doing? Do they spend time drawing? Do they love to play an instrument? Do they love to do things with their hands, to read a book? And how can we be able to support the child even as they get treatment so that their life as children continues? It does not stop just because they are sick. So who then needs palliative care? All children who have a complex chronic condition need palliative care. And the chronic complex condition is defined as a condition that will last for at least one year. And it involves one or several organ systems severely enough to require specialty care. So this is a child who just does not just need a pediatrician or a general practitioner, but it's a child who needs specialized care. It's a child who needs an oncologist, who needs a nephrologist, a neurologist, and most of the time they need a multidisciplinary team. So Together for Short Lives came up with a criteria for illnesses or categories of illnesses that will benefit from palliative care. And there are four groups. So group one, we have curative uh, diseases that can be cured. So curative treatment is available, but sometimes can fail. So this includes uh, diseases like cancer or end organ failure. Category two, we have children who have uh, illnesses that are likely to lead to premature death, like cystic fibrosis, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, advanced HIV, so this is an illness where we are almost sure that this child will live up to a certain point of their life and is likely to die prematurely. Then three, we have progressive conditions without cure. So many neuromuscular or neurodegenerative disorders will fall here where we are not really expecting that um, there is any cure, but the child and the family has to live with that illness. Then we have irreversible, non-progressive conditions that cause severe disability. This includes cerebral palsy, spinal injury, and disability following brain injury. So in the past, we used to give uh, primary care. Then when primary care has failed, we would refer the patient to palliative care. This means that a child would only be referred to palliative care at a time when all interventions have been tried and failed. Uh, the practice was like that, that you try primary care and then you transition to palliative care. And if, of course, the palliative care uh, will be given as end of life care. 
Now, the current approach is that uh, palliative care can be given alongside primary care or curative care. So we are looking at an approach of patient-centered and family-centered care, where we are able to give comprehensive care from the time of diagnosis until death and beyond death, we are actually able to support the patient and their family. So you will find that maybe at the time of diagnosis, the needs, the palliative care needs of the, the child or their family might not be too many. And sometimes as the disease progresses or gets worse, then they need more interventions from the palliative care team. And why this last um, rectangle is the care that we recommend is because uh, when we start palliative care early, we are actually able to support the patient and their family through their journey of illness, whether the patient gets better or not. So for the patients who get cured of their illness, for example, if we go back to our first child who had osteosarcoma, there is a possibility that the osteosarcoma can be treated and the child can go into remission. So in that case, we would manage their pain, we would counsel them, we would give them support, help the family to adapt to the illness. And when the child is okay, we can discharge them from palliative care. When we look at the second child who is having hypoxic brain injury, having episodes of apnea, convulsions, the child's condition might progress. When we've started palliative care early, we are able to, to discuss change of goals of care. We are able to support the parents to understand that there is, no, there is no cure for this illness. Their child might get worse. And we are able to help them make decisions that are best for that child. For example, the child has been referred home, but are the parents actually able to take care of this child at home and provide the care that the, the baby actually needs at home, or do they need more support maybe from a facility, from a hospice, for example. So the scope of palliative care, therefore, we do a lot of pain and symptom management. So that is a big uh, chunk of why patients are referred to us because of severe pain or because of symptoms that cannot be controlled. Then we have advanced care planning, which is uh, for children is about, um, shared decision-making and helping the parents to make good medical decisions about the care of their children now, and even when their, their disease might get worse. We also do diagnostic and prognostic counseling. And remember, it's not just for the, for the family, also for the child. For children who are able to communicate, older children, it is good to also spend time with the children to discuss with them about their illness, to discuss with them about their treatment, about their hospital stay, and about any complications that might arise. And we do this after getting consent from the parents. We also have a big uh, service that is called Child Life. We do have some child life experts in Kenya, and they do work closely with the palliative care team. And Child Life is basically about ensuring that children are able to enjoy the experience of being children despite illness. And I'm sure even within our hospitals, you've seen sometimes play therapy, art therapy, music is being organized for the children. Those are some of interventions that uh, give social support to the children when they're sick. Then we have end of life care. So end of life care constitutes the last six months of life of a child. When a child has a life limiting illness and they get to the last six months of life, the focus becomes managing their symptoms, preparing the family for that death might happen and dealing with any anticipatory grief that the parents may have or their siblings. Then we also do a lot of grief and bereavement support. So in the event that the child dies, we do not stop our care there. We continue to support the parents through the bereavement period and to help them to adjust to the new life without their child. So take home message is that uh, palliative care should start at the time of diagnosis. We should, once we identify a child who is likely to require palliative care, please refer them to us. In Kenya, we still do not have a pediatric palliative care. That means a pediatrician who has specialized in palliative care. So it is still being offered by the adult physicians. And we do this in collaboration with the pediatric teams. So the children are still able to get care as palliative care continues to grow. I know in the near future, we will have pediatric teams who will take up the challenge. So back to my three questions. What comes to mind when you hear palliative care? Do you think children need palliative care and when should they be referred to palliative care? 
I hope uh, from the beginning up to the end of the discussion, I have taught you something that you didn't know. Thank you. These are some of the resources that I used in preparing the presentation. So you can look at the websites and you'll be able to get uh, more information about uh, children's palliative care. There are also some short trainings about uh, neonatal and pediatric palliative care that can help you in your clinical practice. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Dr. Anna Fula. That was very nice. Thank you so much. You're doing some very good work at Kenyatta. So in case anybody has a question, can we put it up on the question and answer session? Uh, our two panelists are ready to answer us so that we don't go home with any questions. In case of any question, kindly put it up in the question and answer session. I can see a number of clubs going up for you, Dr. Nafula and Dr. Alice. We are very grateful. Uh, somebody by the name Anonymous has just said it's a very it's great informative presentation. As we wait for you to write on the chat box, remember you can find these materials on the MOH Virtual Academy. It's on module seven under the communicable diseases or also the M Saratani app that is available in our app stores. I know we can always be able, if you interact with that, that those models, you are able to understand so much about cancer. And remember September is the childhood cancer, so we've been talking about childhood cancers during this month. The link has been shared on the chat box. We are going to reshare it again for the virtual academy. So if you're willing to learn, you can always get it there. It has been reshared again and again. So uh, uh, for Dr. Nafula, Grace is, Grace is asking, how can a child access palliative care, especially without hospital insurance cover? Dr. Tanafula? Mm, so currently, palliative care is still not being covered by insurance, but we do have over 90 centers that are offering palliative care within Kenya. So currently, the costs, we've tried to make the costs very affordable and a lot of palliative care is being supported by donors. So depending on where the child is, if you visit the Kenya Hospices and Palliative Care Association website, you can be able to see which is the nearest palliative care provider to you. There's a contact there. You can call and find out how the child can get onto palliative care. And because uh, some of our activities are donor funded, for those who are not able to afford, sometimes we are also able to link them up with some of the programs that are being supported by donors. Thank you. There's another question for you. Is it advisable or how do you go about telling a child that they are going to die? Is it advisable? Yes, or how are you going to go about telling a child that they are going to die? So now how we approach the, the communication issue, especially with even children and parents, we would not directly tell someone that they're going to die because uh, th that sounds a bit harsh, 
So usually we start the discussion from understanding the illness, understanding the disease process, and just understanding how the child is feeling. And then uh, remember I've talked about things like art therapy and play therapy. So the psychologists do help us to understand what the child understands about death and about their illness. And some children express themselves yeah, through art, through even talking, through music. So the children are able to express. So we actually just deal with the concerns that they bring up. For example, if a child asked, am I going to die? Because sometimes in our worlds, you see there's a child who has died and a child next to them is also sick. They are worried, am I going to die? How we respond to that question is we ask them, why do you ask that question? Then now you are able to discuss more in a more friend friendly manner, rather than just telling them you're going to die soon. We use phrases like the illness uh, has progressed. Uh, we are not able to achieve cure at this time. So we, we actually encourage it to be a communication so that it is between you and the child or you and the parents, not that you're just bombarding them with information. So sometimes we never really get to tell them you're dying, but they figure it out through the conversation and through the interaction. Thank you. Then there's a question for Dr. Ishemi. Is it, is it okay to do fine needle aspiration or is it contraindicated in Will's tumor? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, for fine needle aspiration, it is not useful. When you think about what information you want to get and what utility it's going to be, a fine needle in, uh, aspiration pre-chemo one um, does not give you useful information. When you're talking about histology in Wilms tumor, you want to see one, the components, and for you to get the components, you get you need a larger amount of tissue. And two, you need to see the amount of necrosis uh, that, is, uh, that is in that tissue uh, once you do your pre-op chemotherapy. And a fine needle aspirate will not give you any of this information. Uh, two, uh, I'd like us to move away from doing fine needle aspirations for pediatric tumors, and that is any kind of pediatric tumors. And that is because what they end up doing is delaying uh, diagnosis. Uh, majority of your uh, pediatric cancers, uh, their histology is usually around a small round blue cell. And if you get a small round blue cell, it doesn't tell you what kind of tumor that is. It could be a neuro, it could be a lymphoma, it could be a brain tumor, it could be anything. And you need bigger tissue for you to be able to tell what exactly, what kind of tissue this is. And once you have, once you want to do a biopsy for any kind of childhood cancer, kindly do either a core needle biopsy, ultrasound guided biopsy, or a whole, uh, an excisional biopsy. That would be more informative. You do a final aspirate, you will not have gotten any additional uh, information and you'll have had the risk of upstaging tumor. As I said, imaging is good enough to diagnose Wilms tumor. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, there's another question for Dr. Nafula. What do you do when a parent refuses to take home a child with NG tube, NG tube at home? I think I, I would want to find out uh, the reason for the refusal, quote unquote. Uh, sometimes uh, you find that we, we have a very sick patient. Like the case that I used, we had a child with a tracheostomy and a gastrostomy tube. You might find that the parents have not been trained well how to use the, the nasogastric tube or the tracheostomy. They don't know how to care for the child. And then sometimes they are also afraid of the stigma or the comments that are going to come from their relatives, because we understand uh, we live in a, in, a, in a society where people will visit the child, people will visit the parents. So I think it is good to establish the reason behind that, because sometimes either they are not comfortable with the using of the tube, some of them interpret that their child is too sick. So if my child is not fine, I brought my child to Kenyatta to be treated. Why am I going back home with a sick child? 
then uh, sometimes it might also be the information that they've been given because sometimes we, we tell them the risks of this tube is that the child could get aspiration, the tube could dislodge, but then if we have not allayed those anxieties or reassured them or even to, given them an emergency prepared plan, then they cannot be comfortable to take a child home with the tubes. So just try and establish the reason and then give, give the necessary support. And if the, if the child is being discharged to a facility that is far from yours, also try and give them a link person who can assist them closer to home. Okay, thank you very much. Just last but not least for you is, uh, do patients with heart failure children benefit from palliative care? This was a question by another. Heart failure. Yeah. Yes, it depends on the degree of the heart failure. Remember when we were talking about the, the, the categories of illnesses, we have illnesses that are curable and then we have those that are incurable. So if you can identify an aspect that the, of palliative care that the child can benefit from, then the answer is yes. Because if, if the child needs counseling, their, their family needs counseling, they need to be given information about their illness, they need to know how to live with this child at home, then yes, they need the cardiac care and they also need palliative care. And again, so some have a very severe heart failure that might result in death, so yes, all of those categories of children will need palliative care. Thank you. There's a number of reactions from our, our attendees, but they're seeing very good uh, presentations. Thank you very much. Also, I'll ask Nelson to react on the CPD points. A number of people are complaining about either not being able to feed them, but also not uh, getting the codes. Then uh, Prudence talks about if you can afford free HIV services, the, the, the government needs to up the game on the palliative care for the patients so that we also improve on that side of care. So a number of people are also complaining on the CPD points. Nelson, please take note. Nelson? Our support? Okay, I will, uh, we will, uh, we will be, uh, be left to share. Okay, Nelson, thank you, thank you. Yes, yes, yes. I've seen the, the questions on uh, CPD points and I've replied to those. Uh, kindly note, uh, as communicated, we made some communications via email for PPB. Um, we've also, we will also be making, uh, we'll be sending the codes for this week for NCK. So that those ones will be sent through email. So you'll see the attendance list are sent to the, to the COC for our wardens. And for KMPDC, we have uploaded uh, all the sessions to the, to the ICPD. So visit, uh, kindly visit your ICPD portal and check the status of your account. If you haven't received, that means uh, there might be an issue with your registration, or maybe you haven't met the CPD guidelines that we have set, because uh, we need you to provide some certain details and also attend for a specific um, duration that is at least 30 minutes so that you can receive. Uh, but check on the status of your account. If you see there's an event that you attended fully and uh, you met all the guidelines, you can contact us through knhcpd at gmail.com for follow-up so that you can check on why you haven't received those points. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nelson. Thank you, everybody aboard. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. And thank you to our panelists, Dr. Nafula and Dr. Gishemi. But before we leave, there's one question on the pediatric diabetes series. I received, okay, it's about the points. Nelson will be getting back to you. So thank you, everybody. Let's keep learning. Otherwise, my name is Stacy. I'm an oncology nurse specialist, also the secretary of the oncology nurses chapter. Thank you. <laughs>